My next guest takes on Pedro Munoz coming up here at the Ultimate Fighter Season 28 finale on November 30th. It is Brian Caraway joining me here on the program. Brian, how are you? Good, man. Good. Just uh, pumped to get back in there and uh, compete again. Absolutely, man. It's been a while since we've seen you, and we'll talk about your fighting career in a second. But first, uh, you and I are both Seattle Seahawks fans, and we were talking about the game yesterday. Really disappointing. I can't believe they, they couldn't get it done. Uh, if you're Pete Carroll or you're the GM, John Snyder, what are you doing to tweak things up? Because uh, that was not a good performance yesterday. Man, you know, I, we, we've been up and down. Like, we're doing better than we were, you know. Finally, you know, our offensive line was starting to hold up a little bit. But, uh, you know, it just... Uh, we made a couple of big mistakes. I, I think, you know, we just let him get past our, you know, secondary a little bit. And uh, I felt like actually we were playing a decent game in certain parts and then making huge mistakes. You know, they had a 60 yard, you know, 60 yard throw. Then they had another 34 yard run right after that. And then they had like another uh, a 44 yard run. This, the plays were really only a couple of giant plays they made. You know what I mean? Like just a couple of small, you know, lapses and like just focus, I feel like, but uh I don't know. I, I think our team's still a really young team, and I think it's going to, you know, grow uh, into a championship team, you know what I mean? But it was really frustrating. I think if we see the way the Seahawks played in the last quarter with a little bit more hustle, and, uh, you know, I, I felt like when Russell Wilson threatens to run the ball, it opens up the pass game. That, that was his gift, is being able to scramble, run and gun and throw, and that's what we used to see a lot before when we won the, when we won the Super Bowl and when we went to the Super Bowl against the Pats. You know, he was always threatening uh, – threatening to run the ball so that made guys play a little bit tight and uh, open up the passing game but uh man that was a heartbreaker uh we had a couple couple catches that were just should have been caught hit guys right in the numbers right in the hands um just one of those days i think you know i, I don't know it's frustrating i guess you're looking forward to the fact that uh when vegas gets their team uh, you'll probably be able to go see more games right because i know it's tough for you to get back to to washington yeah, you know, it's, uh, I'll be excited. You know, when I grew up as a little kid, I kind of, you know, was a Raiders fan a little bit just because they're the Pirates, you're a little kid, and it's kind of like the tough guy team. Um, so that's kind of cool. That, you know, out of all the teams, it's the Raiders that are coming to Vegas. Um, but, yeah, man, it'll be cool to have, you know, the Seahawks be able to come here in 2020 and play against the Raiders and, you know, uh, see them and uh, make them some more games. I'm pumped for that. It's been a while since we've seen you in the cage. Uh, we haven't seen you since March. Uh, was this just you nagging injuries, or were you looking to get in there a little bit sooner? What's sort of the reason for, for the gap there? No, I wanted to get in right away. I was healthy afterwards, no injury, you know, no major injuries. Uh, I was pumped, but uh, kind of had a dispute with the UFC a little bit. Um, you know, there's a misunderstanding and a dispute with them. And, uh, you know, my contract was kind of on hold, I guess, if so you say. I, I didn't know that for a few months. I was everything seemed to be okay. And then we were talking in negotiations and all of a sudden they just kind of went silent. And, uh, then a bunch of stuff kind of rose up and then, uh, that they were, you know, kind of had some misunderstandings about, and we ended up, you know, going in with Dana, had a meeting with him and ended up squashing things. And, uh, they actually, uh, they actually unlisted me from the roster. Like, you know, I'm still on the roster, but they actually were going to release me like based on stuff. So they took me out of the rankings. That's why I dropped from the rankings. I was, Looking to maybe sign that. with them. yeah, yeah. So I was thinking about going somewhere else. So I was at the point where I, I was might have been going either looking at Bellator or ACB, you know, things like that. But uh, was a, able to get a meeting with Dana. We sat down and talked things out. And uh, he's, you know, he's actually an understandably, you know, despite of all of his ups downs or whatever people think about him, he he's a pretty logical and reasonable guy you know if you sit down and i just told him, hey man this is what's going on this is what happened this things were going kind of going on bonkers in my life my personal life my family uh you know my my, my dad and my little nephew just a lot of crazy things uh, that happened in my life and i just said shit happens if you want to release me or you know whatever it is that's that's what it is but obviously i'm a top ranked fighter in the ufc and uh he said all right you know th you know those make sense and he's like i understand shit happens and he's, he cleared it up and here I am now getting ready to fight, uh, you know, another top 10 fight in uh, Pedro Munoz. So i still not back in the rankings yet. I don't know what's going on now. Fix that. I, what's going on here? Yeah. yeah. I was number eight. And uh, even after I lost the statement, I think I was six or seven before that, you know, having the win over Aljamain. And then he's been beating guys. And then uh, when they took me out of the UFC, uh, you know, rankings because I wasn't sure about signing anymore, they haven't added me back in. So that'd be kind of a bummer to be eighth, even after losing the statement, which I thought I won that fight. Uh, and then just all of a sudden not even anywhere in the top 15. So I don't know if they're just dragging their feet to get me back in the ranking poll or if they decide to just randomly not put me back in, which would be kind of weird. 
is so did you resign you obviously resigned but how many fights are you with or is this just a one fight deal no 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 so i just my my contract just reinstated the same contract okay so great. whatever just reinstated it so i don't know how many fights i think i have three more fights on it maybe maybe four i'm not sure i don't even pay attention to that kind of stuff I yeah just, you just worry about the fighting leave that other stuff to you know everyone else so i, I, I hear you yeah. I signed with the new management, so uh, I think that was a big hassle. Uh, the reason why the miscommunications from uh, with the UFC is I was doing a lot of stuff myself, and I had been managing Misha for a long time before that. And, uh, you know, it's hard to be the manager and a fighter and athlete at the same time, so I was kind of negotiating, going to bat for her on contracts, and I didn't really make them like me so much, being the bad guy, kind of going after stuff. And uh, I was really focusing a lot on her career and kind of let mine fall a little bit to the side. Um, but we went in and we squashed those things. I signed with the new manager, Daniel Rubenstein. Oh, Ruby. you're with Ruby. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Ruby, he's awesome, man. And uh, I think that's, you know, I think it's going to be a big turnaround. You know, having him negotiate stuff with the UFC, he has a good relationship with them. And uh, to be able to get good fights, get me relevant out there, stay, keep me active. And, uh, you know, cross my fingers, get me paid more because I believe, you know, I'm not complaining. I'm glad to be in the UFC, but I believe I'm one of the lowest paid guys in the top 10 or was in top 10 in the entire UFC, the entire rock. You know what I mean? So there was guys I beat that were getting paid as much as to me to lose as I was getting paid to win. So, you know, like I said, I'm not complaining. I'm so fortunate to be able to fight and still make a living, but uh, it definitely should be nice to get paid more. How did you end up signing with Daniel Rubenstein? Uh, did he reach out to you? You reach out to him? How did that come together? I've known him for a long time. You know what I mean? Just, just being around the UFC, you know, he managed a lot of people. Uh, I used to help coach kind of train uh, with like Mike Chiesa, uh, Sam Cecilia, all those guys in Jitsu, and uh, Juliana Pena. I used to kind of help coach and run their school up there. And uh, Rubenstein manages Chiesa. And just, he managed a Sun Tzu. I fought a Sun Tzu. And uh, he lives in Vegas, so I'd run into him all the time, you know, whatever, you know, at the PI. You know, whatever, there'd be UFC events. Uh, I did a couple guest appearances. I'd be traveling a lot when I was with Misha and we were together. And I just saw him around all the time. And then he actually pulled me over when all this was going on and said, you know, uh, he stopped me outside the PI and said, hey, Caraway, you, you, you know, where's your heart at? And I'm like, what are you talking What are you talking about? He's like, you still want to fight? You still want to win a world title? And I said, hell yeah, man. And he's like, because I was kind of talking to him about management for a while. And he's like, ah, you know, I really don't have any openings for any guys. And then I, he kind of caught wind of what was going on with the UFC. And stuff, and he said, hey, I'm going to help. If you're still ready to fight, let's, let's team up and let's do it. Excellent. Even there was no hesitation with the fact that he's a 49ers fan? Uh, uh, that, uh, you know, I just think that's just more fun to, to uh, talk shit to him for. So that kind of makes good camaraderie, I think, bickering on that kind of stuff. Let's talk about the Cody Stamen fight really quickly. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but 11 media members scored the fight for you compared to four media members scoring it for Stamen. I know it's disappointing to lose, but does that make you feel a little bit better that people thought you won the fight? I not really, because I thought I won the fight regardless of the media. I mean, I guess it does. It's better to say that everybody, it's better to have that than people, everybody saying he lost. So, I mean, that is a positive note. But ultimately, my paycheck got cut in half. My rankings got hurt, you know, like my name. Uh, and more importantly, you know, like, I don't want to say my pride, but uh, I don't know, that was a, you know, it sucks, you know, the biggest thing for me is, like, how my pay got cut in half, you know, that sucks, especially because I haven't been active for a long time, so I really was counting on that, and, uh, but, you know, I fought a piss poor performance, I think, on, on my end, I fought terribly, uh, no excuses aside, uh, I, you know, not saying the excuse, but stuff happens, and I was have, going through a really, really hard time in that camp, and uh, not, not like I said, not to make excuses, but just to kind of give the fans and people what's going on, you know, my, my head coach, Coach Fallis, uh, who was like a father figure to me, had been cornered me for six years, uh, I found out literally like four days after I took the statement fight, literally like four days that he had shot and killed himself and committed suicide, and he was such a huge person in my life, um, My not only my training camp, but in my life as a friend, as a mentor, uh, you know, he's like a father figure to me. I didn't really have my dad close to me in my life growing up. And he kind of, you know, I didn't realize how much it was until you lose somebody. And, uh, so I was kind of right in the middle of the very beginning of my camp. My head coach is gone. Misha was, you know, she always cornered me for like the last 10 years. Uh, so there, there goes, you know, 66% of my corner. I didn't have in, you know, in my corner. And then, uh, 
you know, just a lot of stuff. And then this personal stuff was going on with Misha, you know, like a week later on that, I found out she was pregnant and, you know, we're, we're still cool with each other and talk, but it's still kind of a hard gut when you're with somebody for 10 years. And then you find out that, that they end up getting pregnant a year later after you broke up. I mean, I'm happy for her and stuff, but it was just one more thing kind of on my mind. But the big thing was, uh, you know, coach Fallis, uh, dealing with that. And then, uh, my dad ended up going into like some, having some really bad psychotic problems uh some ptsd from vietnam and uh he's actually in a mental hospital right now um during that camp i moved them down to las vegas to live with me to help take care of my little nephew who was in a logging accident two years ago and suffered a major brain injury and uh, to kind of help my mom out and uh, my dad slowly started losing his mind just started talking about stuff like he's in the war uh, almost schizophrenia like making up full entire stories thinking our house was bugged so just kind of doing all this kind of compiled on one thing and just it made it really, really difficult, you know, uh, you know, just emotionally and physically to kind of stay focused. I mean, I, I think, I don't know, you know, if any of that actually had a play in the fight, you know, maybe it was just time off. Maybe I was just too cautious. I don't know, but I, I felt like I had a very poor performance in that fight, you know, uh, just is what it is. I just didn't execute the game plans a lot. I left a lot of stuff on the table. I didn't really turn it on until that last, you know, third round, the last minute and a half. That's what I was supposed to be doing the whole fight, you know, more like the Eddie Wineland fight. Shoot, you know, if the guy stuffs your shots, come up, push forward, press, you know, just really make it a, you know, dirty, dirty fight. You know, a lot of the commentators, you know, were saying that I was looking tired, but it's kind of my style. You know, I've, I've had hurt shoulders in the past and, um, you know, my, my punches might not be look as crisp because I'm not a kickboxer. So my punches might get a little tired in the round, but my cardio is still really good. Even though I might look a little sloppy, my actual lung capacity and cardio is really good. So I can press people because I'm not breathing hard. Just my muscles might be a little bit more fatigued. And someone like Stamen, who's very mus musculaturally, at, you know, fit, he can keep his punches crisp, but he had no, he had no air. And then when I finally figured that out, like, hey, man, I need to press this guy. You know, I ended up clipping him. He took a bad shot. And, man, if I had five more seconds on that choke at the end of the third round, uh, he would have he would have been finished. The choke was so tight. And uh, even afterwards, he said, man, that choke was super tight. But, you know, so the cookie crumbles, you know, hats off to him. He came up and he fought a brilliant game plan. You know, uh, he executed extremely well. And uh, especially after losing the first round and to come back and win the next two, uh, good for him, man. Wow. Uh, well, good for you for getting through all that. And, you know, I wish your dad the best, man. That's really tough to hear. And I hope everything's uh, going in the right direction. Um, let's talk about this fight, though. Pedro Munoz, a top guy. He's got that 16-3 and record. How do you feel like you match up against him in this fight? Uh, you know, good, man. I think, uh, obviously, he's a good grappler. He's, you know, legit black belt. And it's somebody I actually respect. Uh, you know what I mean? Some guys are black belts or they say they're good grappler and they're trash guys like that. But he's legit. Uh, you know, he's got legit grappling. He's got, you know, solid kickboxing. I think he's one of the, the least underrated guys in the UFC. You know, I think they have him ranked number nine, and I think he would kill John Lineker. That's his teammate. Uh, I'm not going to say anything, but I've, I've been down to ATT, and I've talked to people. Uh, I just think there's so many guys uh, that he could beat. But that being said, I think what Pedro Munoz lacks is uh, fight IQ. I'm not saying he's a dumb guy by any means, but I think he has too much of that machismo, Brazilian – you know, paw ha attitude where he's just uh, wants to stand and bang and fight everybody striking. The guy's got world class jujitsu, great scrambling, and all he does is strike this entire fight. Like, what are you doing, dude? Like, use your brain. Like, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna not be in the sport for a very long time, taking a lot of punches. He just ends up in a kickboxing match with everybody. And, uh, you know, and he stands square and he just throws heat the whole time. So, you know, I could play into my game good because I'm a mixed martial artist. I'm going to strike you, punch you, knock you out. I'm going to always be threatening the takedowns, you know, pressuring forward. Uh, you know, I believe that my grappling is one of the best in the world and definitely one of the best in the division. And, uh, you know, I think I bring different levels of the game, you know, uh, of being able to mix up high, low punching. And I, I feel like he just underutilizes his skills by just striking the entire time. He lost a close decision to Dotson. I thought he won, but like he fought that guy in his fight the whole time. You know, he didn't, Dotson's grappling's nowhere near at the levels his, and uh, Dotson's a smaller opponent, and he didn't put his will on him. He didn't put his strength and his size on him. He just kickboxed with the guy who's one of the fastest guys in the division. Blows my mind. He does it every single time. Uh, but anyway, that is what it is. You know, I think I match up well with him. Uh, he's, you know, anybody in the top 10 is going to be a tough fight, but I think obviously, uh, you know, I think my wrestling, I think my jiu-jitsu is better than his, you know, my catch wrestling, my MMA style wrestling. And I think uh, I'm just, a, overall, I think I'm a better MMA fighter. He might do things better than me in certain areas, but I think I put it together better than him. 
As far as your training camp, how are you structuring things and who are some of the guys uh, as far as like main training partners that you work with? Uh, so one of my main training partners is my good friend, Gustavo Lopez, who I uh, help coach and manage. Uh, he's up and coming really tough. He's a 135 pounder, fights for combate. Yeah, I, inter- I actually interviewed him before his last fight. I should mention that quickly. Really good guy. Yeah, awesome guy. He's my roommate now. I've been coaching him since he was barely in high sc- out of high school and college. Uh, from, he's from Washington State. Um, so he came out here like three years ago to come train with me and live with me. And, uh, so he's one of my main go-to guys. Um, man, I have Boston Salmon who's fighting on the card with me, uh, on the same card. Phenomenal striker, man. That kid's got so much power, so much talent. Uh, he's, you know, in his mid twenties, he's got the, you know, he's awesome. Dan Ega, another UFC veteran, you know, legit black belt, um, wrestled in college, you know, Wartburg, Iowa, uh, just a savage, you know, I got Neo Lahat used to UFC veteran. Um, you know, he fought in Bellator now and he, he's black belt in judo, legit black belt and a black, legit black belt in jiu-jitsu, great striking, well-rounded, man, I, the list goes on. I got a whole room of studs for training partners, um, for, for my corners, it's been kind of a little tricky, you know, uh, Misha knew my style for a long time. You know, obviously she's doing her thing and coach Foss, you know, end up, you know, passing away and, uh, Gustavo has been my right hand guy in my corner, but, uh, you know, I, Last corner, like I know Dennis Davis, he was in my corner, uh, my last fight, and Coach Eric Nixick. And, uh, you know, I've known Dennis for a long time since Team Quest back in the day. I'm from Washington. We're both Pacific Northwest boys. But it was kind of like a last minute, just them jump in. And I hadn't really run a camp with Dennis. And uh, Eric was always in my corner before, but it was Coach Falls who was my, my lead guy. And Eric kind of would just be like the morale support, pump me up, hype guy, football guy, you know, let's mess this guy up kind of guy. And, uh, they're, they're awesome guys, but it's just taking, it's taking me a second to kind of figure out where I fit in a little bit better. And uh, I realized I just kind of wanted to go back more to my roots and people know me. So, uh, I brought out my buddy, uh, Pete Nicasio, who is, uh, one of my really good friends. Uh, you know, he's from the Northwest as well. He used to train Ivan Salivaries. Um, and he actually moved down to Vegas uh, with me and trained here at Extreme Couture. And we just became really close. He's actually currently in medical school right now, but, uh, he knows my game really well. And he, uh, he understands the fight game. He has a really high, uh, you know, fight IQ and just smart, intelligent in, in a lot of ways. And he understands what, what I bring to the table, even though I'm a little bit awkward and, you know, unorthodox on things. So I'm having him, uh, coach Eric Nixick and Gustavo in my corner. And this, this is, this is Pedro himself right here. How you doing? So, uh, he flew out actually from Chicago, taking time away from studying for med, you know, to finish up his med school to uh, come out and help him corner me. So uh, I have really good people around me, people yeah. I trust that are Give close me to me. And I'm kind of just bringing it back to the roots, bringing it back to guys with Gustavo and Pete that are from the Northwest. Uh, Eric Nixick was a guy when I first moved to Vegas six years ago, he kind of took me in and we've been, you know, really close right. friends uh, this whole entire time. How do you see this fight playing out on November 30th? You know, I, I think it's gonna. I think this is a candidate. I'm saying right now. I think this is a candidate for fight of the night. Like I don't take him easy, and I don't back up. The thing that the fans are gonna want to watch this is Pedro Munoz doesn't back up. He plants his feet and throws, and uh, I don't back up either. So neither one of us, uh, either one of us, are not afraid to fight. So uh, you're gonna see fireworks. I'm gonna come forward. I'm gonna push. I'm gonna make this fight. You know, I always say it, but I'm gonna make this fight ugly. I was supposed to make it last fight ugly. I'm gonna learn from my mistakes, and I'm gonna really push the pace on this guy. And you're gonna see everything, man. You're gonna see a slugfest. You're gonna see me out wrestling him. You're gonna see some great grappling exchanges. I know he's gonna be a hard guy to hold down. You know, he might even take me down. But I can promise you fireworks. I can promise you you're gonna see a lot of a lot of scrambling you don't see at the higher weights. You don't see you don't see this kind of scrambling at even 155 170 185 you don't see the guys are going to be moving and hitting the techniques that we move so i can promise you an extremely gritty technical you know awesome fight i promise you that much and uh it's going to be looking with me to to either grind him out or or finish him i'm looking for uh always either a tko finish um you know, I, I feel like this fight can happen anyway. I'm a, I've been training really hard. I feel like I can knock him out. I feel like, you know, I can ground up on him. And, and I feel like with the pressure, I can break him and, and uh, end up getting a choke out of him, you know, just from uh, imposing my will. Last question before I let you go. Big news last week. Demetrius Johnson gets traded to one championship for Ben Askren. What was your reaction to that? And is there anyone you want to see traded to the UFC? Holy smokes. But uh, knowing on the inside, it makes sense because Matt Hume is the, you know, the Demetrius is obviously in for Washington State, so I know him very well. I know that, you know, AMC, Matt Hume, all them. And uh, I knew it made sense just because Matt Hume is the matchmaker. I know 1FC has money to pay him. Uh, the UFC, you know, 
yeah, Demetrius wasn't garnishing the, the the fans that he needed to get. I didn't think the UFC promoted him like they did anybody else. You know, I don't really believe that they did. Uh, I mean, the marketing machine there is incredible. They can make they can sell sand on a beach to people, and I think they put limited. They didn't believe in him, so they put a limited marketing on him. But uh, you know, good for him. I think you know one FC is going to be paying him a ton of money. And uh, it's cool to have Ben Askren come over. There's a lot of talk of saying, can these other champions and these other organizations compete in the UFC? They usually come over, you know, Hector Lombard, they get smashed. They don't do well. So, you know, it's a different level at the UFC. So I'm kind of interested in it. Even though I was a, a funk fan my, my whole wrestling career, and I love Ben Askren, and I want to see him as a wrestler and a funk guy do well, I kind of also want to see guys that are not in the UFC doing well come in and get smashed. Because it makes me feel better about you know being the <laughs> yeah. myself. So I'm like, dude, the UFC is another level, man. You, people can't hang. It makes it you know gives us a little bit more clout and credit to the guys that are doing well in the UFC. But uh, anybody else I'd like to see, you know, uh, I'd like to see Bibiano Fernandez. I think he's a guy, you know, even though it's in my weight class, and uh, to have another stud in there would be, you know, makes it even more difficult for myself. But I think he's a guy I'd want to see the you know get a crack at at getting into the UFC and and doing some work. Um, you know, I, I don't know who else. Maybe, oh man, who else? There's a few different guys. I can't think of anybody right off the top of my head. But uh, Bibby's a good pick, man. It's he's, he's from uh, he's from my home province of Vancouver. He lives there now, so uh, you know that that's excellent. It's good to hear. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I haven't really thought too much, but him right off the right top of my head. No, that's a good choice, and this is going to be a great fight. It's coming up here November 30th. It is the Ultimate Fighter 28 finale. Brian, I really appreciate the time, man. Just remind people where they can find you on social media, and if you have any sponsors or shoutouts, the floor is yours, man. Awesome, man. Everybody check me out at uh, Brian Caraway. You know, everything's just at Brian Caraway, B-R-Y-A-N-C-A-R-A-W-A-Y. And uh, that's my Twitter and my Instagram. Uh, I'm going to be starting to post a lot more. I know I haven't been active the last couple of years. Uh, stuff's been crazy, but I'm getting back on the active channel. Uh, you know, going to start posting a lot of stuff, you know, uh, start fighting a lot more. Follow me if you like, you know, motocross, dirt bikes, off-road toys, Baja stuff. You know, you like, you know, hot chicks whatever guns if you like if you like anything that encompass america or motorsports uh or anything extreme you know follow me i'm going to start going to i think i'm going to start a travel blog you know i think i i hit up nine countries last year 2017 so uh, i'm just backpacking all over the world so uh you know follow me if you uh want to see some cool travel destinations see some cool stuff